we've got the Marantz AV10 and Amp10 15.4 channels of bliss. That's what we're gonna be talking about in today's video. Hey folks, I'm Gene Delisalo with Audioholics. I'm very excited. We've got this 15.4 channel uh, AV separates from Marantz, the processor, and the 16 channel amplifier. I haven't been this enthusiastic about getting a pair of separates like this since back in the day when Denon had the AVP and POA 10 channel amplifier and processor. That thing was a beast. And I'm glad to see that Marantz has stepped up their game now and making products on that level only with the latest tech. So this is gonna be a basic unboxing video. I'm gonna give you some technical details you're not gonna find anywhere else. And of course, we're gonna be following up with exhaustive bench test results. We're gonna be comparing the room correction systems from Odyssey versus Dirac. We're gonna be having a lot of fun with these. So let's open these up. Let's see what's inside the box. Let's get our sleeves up and see what's going on here. So the first one I'm looking at is the 15.4 channel. This is the AV10, it retails for uh, $7,000. And I'm going to be unboxing this here for you guys very carefully. And um, it's very interesting what kind of tech that Marantz is putting into these products. There's some unique features I wanna to talk to you guys about, especially about how it's handling base management. And we're gonna be doing a technical presentation on the base management features of this product as well. So the first thing I see when I open this box is of course she comes with an Odyssey microphone, a calibrated microphone. This is for when you're running Odyssey, whether you're doing it through the, the AVR or you're doing it through the PC software, which is an additional upgrade option. Of course, we got our power cable, a two-pronged power cable. And Marantz gives you this nice box. Let's see what's in the box. Now this product comes with a three year warranty and you've got a very nice brushed aluminum remote control and you've got the user manual and unlocking the magic of unlimited high resolution. So this has the latest in HEOS, which supports you know, Spotify, Amazon Music, Pandora. You could run Tidal, Deezer. It's got pretty much everything. The music management system is pretty cool in here. You've got an AM antenna, of course, for those aficionados. Now it comes with their infamous Odyssey microphone stand, which is cardboard. Honestly, I would just toss this. Get a real microphone stand if you're gonna be serious about calibration. And you've got stickers for your inputs, which is very useful. Um, I like that feature. So I'm gonna move this stuff to the side right now. All right, this is a big ass processor, man, for something that doesn't have an amp section in it. It's the size of a flagship AVR. Okay, so I'm just gonna pull these stickers off here. And I like this new look that Marantz is doing. They follow this with their hi-fi components, kind of this uh, graded look here. Now it looks like aluminum, but it feels like plastic, but it's a very high quality plastic. And it has a flip down door. So it has the little porthole design. I know a lot of people complain about the porthole because it's too small, but it's really just to show you the volume control. If you want to see more details, there's an LED display when you do the flip down. Not a huge LED display, not like you get with like an Anthem, where Anthem gives you the TFT display, which I really like. It's got USB on the front. It's got the port for the microphone. I'm disappointed that a lot of the uh, AVR companies these days are not putting an HDMI input on the front. I understand why, because it's hard to do 8K when you make your traces longer like that. So I'm thinking maybe they didn't put an HDMI on the front for people that want all their inputs to be supported by 8K. But you do have seven inputs that are 8K. You've got three outputs, two of them are 8K, the other one's 4K. So you've got a lot of connectivity here. You've got multiple zones, three zones of audio. It's got 17 channel uh, connections, preamp outputs on it, all XLR. Even though it only supports 15 channels of processing, it gives you an extra pair in case you want to do different speaker configurations to reroute for Oral 3D. So this supports Dolby Atmos, DTS-X Pro, 
IMAX Enhanced and Oro 3D. It's got all your immersive surround formats supported in this unit. Okay, so regarding the base redirection features, there are four independent subwoofer outputs on here, both for balanced and unbalanced. The, the, when I say independent, what that means is you have independent delay and independent level control. Now, Marantz is doing something new on this product and its sister company, Denon, the A1H uh, 15 channel um, receiver, is you've got the ability to redirect base. So if you set up four subwoofers in the room, you could have them set up as zones. So if you got one subwoofer in each corner, you could have a base zone for the front left corner, a base zone for the front right corner, the right rear corner and the left rear corner. And it'll take the base from any associated channel that is base matted and dump the base to the closest subwoofer. So there's a mixed school of thought about that. Personally, if you look at the research that's been done over the decades from Harmon, from the guys like Dr. Todd Welty, Sean Olive, Floyd Toole, um, the really the best way to take advantage of multi-sub is to have all your subwoofers playing a mono mix that way you can manipulate the room modes and get the best seat to seat consistency. That way EQ is far more effective for a wider seating area. When you break this up into different zones, not all the bases correlated at that point. So you're not getting the full benefit of multi base distribution and, and standing wave uh, manipulation. But there is another school of thought saying that in some aspects, base waves are directional if you have the subwoofers to the sides of the room. We're gonna be doing a video on that. But right now the jury is out, but it's nice that Marantz gives you the option to do the base redirect, or if you wanna do a mono split. I think there's another option where you could send uh, one of the subwoofers the LFE signal if you wanna do a tactile transducer. The only problem I see with that is if you're not getting LFE to the other subs, you're losing that ability to have the, multi, uh, the benefit of multi subs for the LFE signal. I'm gonna be testing that just to see what's going on with that. So you also have a pair of XLR inputs if you're into really high-end analog two-channel audio. Now for the DAC section, this is actually using a really good DAC. It's from ESS, it's the 9018. It's a stereo DAC, so they use eight of them. So um, one of the channels is unused. And the signal to noise ratio is really good on those DACs. I think it's over 120 dB, so it's, it should be adequate. Now, there's a lot of technology in here that overlaps with the Denon A1H. It's got very similar, uh, basically identical HDMI boards. It's got a similar uh, DAC section. They both use the 9018 DACs. The only difference that differentiates the Marantz here is obviously there's no amplifier section in it, but also they have their HDAM preamplifier circuitry, which they claim is a discrete circuitry. And I've measured HDAM in the past it definitely measures different. I know Marantz is going after their own sonic signature with the brand. They're trying to give a warm sound. I'll try to measure and verify those claims. I'm not too sure if there's a, is a true benefit to that or if it's just kind of like a thing that Marantz is just trying to differentiate from the Denon brand. In either event, I'm really impressed with the build quality of this beautiful uh, back panel layout here. The only thing that's missing is legacy connections. So if you guys have a Nintendo Wii like I do, you're gonna have to buy an HDMI adapter from Component or Composite Video because this has none of those legacy connections. And that's a trend we're seeing now with a lot of the AVRs coming out. They're just only supporting HDMI. Now, if you're a gamer, this thing does do variable refresh rate, um, auto low latency, and quick frame transport to reduce or eliminate lag from uh, frame tearing. So basically, you should have no lag if you're plugging your Xbox or your PlayStation 5 into this thing. I mean, that was a problem in the last generation is you couldn't do the full support for those gaming platforms. This one should be able to support it. The max data rate through these HDMI uh, circuits is 40 gigabits. It's not the full 48. There's currently no processors on the market or hardware that supports that, only than a couple of TVs. But that's a lot of data rate. This has some of the most advanced HDMI modules we've seen. They put giant heat sinks on this to keep the heat down, to keep the reliability really good. And that's one of the strengths of the Denon and the Marantz brands is they have really rugged um, HDMI capability. They've been really well vetted and well tested. So just you know, to end this part of this unboxing here, this thing is really well built. It looks beautiful. It's got a nice thick aluminum case. It weighs about 37, almost 40 pounds for a processor. That's pretty darn good. Three year warranty is also really good. So let's check out the amplifier now, the Amp 10 and see what that's all about.
All right, so the Amp 10 is a 16 channel amplifier. It also retails for $7,000. So we're looking at 14,000 for the pair. And it's rated at 200 watts times 16. Now this is off of a 15 amp line. So you're not gonna get 200 watts times 16 because it would need a lot more power than that. But I will give you some basic calculations here on how much power we get in a minute. But first I wanna go over what's in the box. So you've got your power cord. Again, it's a two prong. It's got this box here. Let's see what's in the box. So they give you a speaker terminal wrench. This is a handy tool for when you're tightening down your binding post with your cables. It comes with a 3.5 millimeter amp control for your trigger. And it has a remote controllable connector cable, RCA cable. And of course you got your user manual. This thing weighs a little over 40 pounds and it comes again with a three year warranty. Now, normally when you have a 16 channel amplifier, if it's a linear and not a class D like this one, I wouldn't be able to lift it out of the box like I'm about to do. Just think about it, the Denon that I've talked about before, the 10 channel, that thing weighed 132 pounds and it broke my back when I had to stick that in my rack. This thing weighs basically a third of that and it's got more channels and it has 200 watts times 16. So let's get this out of the box. It's not super heavy. All right, so following the cosmetic of the AV-10, it has the uh, nice pattern here, got the power button, got the little porthole that shows you power consumption, which I think uh, monitors channel one. Very clean look. So just to go over what's inside this unit, it's a class D module. It actually uses the ice edge chipset. And I think Marantz customized it for their own design. So the ice edge is basically a 200 watt stereo module. There's eight of them in here and each one of them has their own 500 watt SMPS power supply. Now Marantz talks about on their website that they have a toroid in here, a large toroid. And you would think it has a linear power supply, but that linear power supply is only for the control circuits with the HDAM and the amplifier controller itself. The power that delivers for each of these amplifier modules is independent from an SMPS power supply that's regulated. That's really a great way to do class D. You need that tight regulation on class D. It's not lossy like when you do linear amplifiers. So you get a tighter regulation and you get very clean power. Now this is rated at 200 watts into eight ohms, 400 watts into four ohms. So it's very four ohm stable. You could bridge amplifier channels. So you can take the 16 channel amp and make it an eight channel amp and have 400 watts at eight ohms. It won't double into four ohms because of the 500 watt limitation. So in reality, if you're using a four ohm speaker that really dips down a low impedance, there's not a lot of advantage to bridging this amplifier. You can only get at max 500 watts minus efficiency, which is about 90%. So maybe you'll get 450 watts into four ohms. I don't really recommend that. What I would do if you were setting up a 15 channel speaker system, like a 9.4.6, is I would use that extra channel and I would bridge the center channel to get more power to your center channel. That way you don't feel like you're wasting an amplifier channel. So I wanted to address something. I saw this on the forums where people were looking at this amplifier and saying, how could this deliver so much power if the power consumption is only 500 watts on the back panel? I did a video in a tech article about that. When you look at power consumption on the back of an amplifier, unless it says max power, when it says, in this case, 500 watts, they have a very specific way of rating that. What they do is they drive every channel at 1 8th power. And if you do that, if you take the 200 watts and take 1 8th of that times 16, it's a little over 400 watts. So you've got some inefficiencies for the class D, which is 90%, and then you got some control circuits that consume power. So that's how they're getting that 500 watts. Like I was saying before, 120 volts at 15 amps is at 1800 watts. So if you do the math, and you take out the efficiency of 90% and some of the overhead here, you could legit see that this amp could do 200 watts a channel with eight channels driven and probably 100 watts a channel with 16 channels driven. And that's one of the best values. Even though this is $7,000, I don't know of any other 16 channel amp in one chassis that could give you that much power and at that value. I mean, if you're looking at other 16 channel amps, whether it's from Storm, Audio, or Trinov, they're much more expensive than this. So this, 
I'm going to take a look at the bench test and see how this thing performs, but it sounds like it's quite a good value for a high-end, very high channel count Class D amplifier. And I want to show you the back panel here. And basically, I really dig these connectors. I mean, they look beautiful. I like the fact that they give you that locking uh, tool to help you lock down the speaker cables. There's XLR and unbalanced connections here. They look like they're really well mounted. Lots of screws to keep them stable so they're not going to rip off if you uh, stick a cable on there that gets down there too tight. And of course, there's a switch that you could either do bi-amp, normal, or bridge tied load. As I was telling you before, the bridge tied load gives you double the power at 8 ohms, not so much more power at 4 ohms based on the power supply limitations here. Um, I don't know what else to say about this amplifier other than I can't wait to bench test this and ultimately connect it with the AV10 to hear what kind of sound quality we can get from these Moran separates. As Hugo used to say, these are nice pieces of equipment. I can't wait to verify that on the bench and the listening test. I hope you guys found this video useful. Don't forget about our Patreon channel at patreon.com slash audiohawks. We appreciate your support. You get direct access to me if you want to suggest video topics or ask questions. And until next time, my friends, keep listening.